Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pleasant View Bible Church. Um, we're so excited you guys are here this morning, so let's stand and sing together as we worship our King.
Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my favorite verses is in the book of Philippians chapter 3 and it's my favorite it's really one of my favorite lines that it's in the New Testament and the line is but our citizenship is in heaven it really grounds the perspective of what life is really for Um, thinking about seasons where life is really good and things are going really easy even during those seasons we need to remember that our citizenship is not here our citizenship is in heaven. And on the other spectrum, when things are hard, when people pass, when, when there's tragedies that happen and things, like, things are continuing to get worse in our lives during those seasons, equally, 
valuable to remember that our citizenship ultimately is not here, but it's in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior there, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is a King seated among us. Let every heart receive Him now. Where there is praise he will inhabit there will be grace and mercy all around and every burden will be lifted in his presence every trophy will be laid down
welcome you here today. If uh, this is your first Sunday here, or maybe even your second, uh, we particularly want to extend a welcome to you. Let, we kn let you know that uh, we're excited to, to worship our God, and we're uh, extra excited to have you join with us in that. So uh, thank you for being here. And we have a welcome table in both foyer, and if you've never made your way there, we would encourage you to do that. We've got a small gift for you, and we'd love just to learn a little bit more about you at the same time. So at this time, we're going to dismiss our kids. If uh, you're here up to the age of third grade, uh, we've got a special program for you uh, right downstairs below here. So if you could make your way to the back, uh, you will be me uh, meet met by somebody there that will help escort you down to the room. And then at this time, uh, one of our elders, Give Noop, is going to come and pray for us. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that your name is the name that, that reigns above all the other names. We're thankful that you are our king. As we look at the world, as we look at our nation, how easy it is to become uh, discouraged and feel that it's hopeless that things will ever become the way they sh should be, the way that you meant for them to be when you created our world. We do uh, continue to pray uh, for those who live in Ukraine, that you would protect your remnant there, that you would save them from the destruction that's going on. We pray that as you are the king, that you would cause a, a ceasing of the military action that's going on in that part of the world, and that you would bring it to nothing, and that <clears throat> it would be clear that the glory is to you when that happens. We pray for our nation as we become more and more divided politically and in many ways just there is so much anger and resentment against uh, people that we don't agree with. We, we pray that you would help each one of us to do our part to be healing instead of tearing apart. That, uh, that we do, but we're thankful again that Jesus is the king here and we just pray that that your reign would, would take over and that we would see it in our nation. We're thank you, we thank you for our church and the church family that we have here that we're all able to enjoy. And we get together each Sunday morning, we get together as small groups and we're thankful for the, the establishment of the church and what it means in each one of our lives. We're thankful for the way that you have prospered us we're thankful for the opportunity that we have starting this fall to have a child care center here. We know that many things have to still happen for that to work properly, and we just pray for each step in that process. And we look forward to the, the time when many children will be here during the week, and they'll be learning about Jesus. And they'll be learning about Jesus uh, when probably many would not hear about him otherwise and we thank you for that chance and we just pray that even now you'd be preparing hearts for that and we pray that many unchurched families would would bring their children here for us to care for we know there are needs in our family physically we think of of andy kerr rod bowman randy swanson and just pray for the specific physical needs that they have that you would provide blessing we just pray all these things now in jesus name Amen. You know, any time you have been to a funeral, you've been reminded of the curse that is death. 
And this is particularly true when you've been to a funeral of a young child or a teenager who, who died in some tragic way, either maybe with some sort of childhood disease, maybe they were in a car accident, uh, a teen with a drug overdose, or, uh, or even a young service person uh, in the military maybe who died in war in their uh, 20s. And uh, we're just sort of, particularly in those situations, oftentimes parents, siblings, grandparents, really wrestle with that question of why didn't God intervene? Why didn't he do something for them? Oftentimes that parent, maybe if, if there was some sort of warning, if, if uh, that child had a sickness or a disease that they were dealing with, they probably prayed multiple times every day for God to please intervene, please heal their child. And when that day finally came and the child wasn't healed and, and the child passed away because of it, uh, just those feelings of why, is God even listening, does he even care, where was he, was he present, it doesn't seem like it, it certainly didn't feel like it. We have uh, friends of ours from Pennsylvania who recently had the tragic loss of their son, he was I think 40 years old, uh, died of a brain tumor, and um, I guess what makes the story even a little more tragic is their only other son uh, died in infancy, and that was extremely hard for them. They'd shared uh, years after the event, they hadn't really talked about it for years publicly, and they, they shared, you know, uh, the church I attended in Pennsylvania, they, they shared about that difficulty of, of going through it. And so I can only imagine here to lose their other son at a relatively young age is, is all the more tragic for them. You know, when you wrestle with these questions of why, why didn't God do anything? Why didn't he step in? Why didn't he prevent it? These are certainly complex questions in, in one respect, and uh, they require more than just a simple trite or shallow, simplistic answer. They certainly don't deserve some sort of a cliche that we just sort of tag on to everyone, uh, to every situation, and I certainly don't intend for the message this morning to come across in that way. But what I do hope that the message this morning will articulate is the fact that God has provided the solution for death. In fact, there's a, there's a wonderful promise, maybe even the most amazing promise in all of the Old Testament that shows up uh, in our passage this morning that we will get to eventually here. But uh, it is a promise about God taking care of death. Now, the, 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 the passage this morning that we're going to look at is a little bit broader. Again, it's three chapters, 25, 26, and 27. And I don't intend to work through each of those, each of the verses this morning. We're not even going to have time to read through it all. And so I did this a couple weeks ago. I provided what I called an exegetical summary statement um, that if, if you're kind of working through Isaiah, maybe in your personal devotions, your personal reading, and... Uh, and that would be helpful for you to, to sort of read, read that as you read along through. encourage you to either pick one up in either of the foyers or uh, on the church's app under the sermon notes for this morning. Uh, there's a link there. You can either print that out at home or you can just read it off your, your device. Whatever helps you, if you want to take that, if that will be helpful for you, encourage you to, to pick that up. Because we're not going to cover everything this morning. But uh, if I were to tell you that the predominant theme in these chapters was judgment, would anyone be surprised? That has been a predominant theme throughout the whole book of Isaiah. Uh, and, and it's true of this passage as well, that uh, the judgment of the world uh, is significant here. And it's particularly viewed through the lens of, of a metaphor, if you would, or of, a, of the imagery of the destruction of the city. And so the, the, the imagery of the city being destroyed and the inhabitants in it being uh, destroyed along with them is sort of the imagery that's used for judgment here. And it comes up in all three of these chapters. So Isaiah chapter 25 in verse 2, it says, For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. And so... 
what you have to understand is that the city is not specifically referring to a particular city. It's not like the city of Jerusalem or the city of Rome. It's, it's using this in a metaphorical sense to refer to the civilizations of the wicked person, the, the, the world. This idea of, of the place where they dwell, the place where they live, You know, in that day and age in particular, when you think about cities, cities were the place where people would find security and safety. It's the place where they would go when they were being attacked, when there was a foreign invader. They would come and they would go inside their cities, they would shut the gate, and it provided them a pretty significant aspect of safety and security. The walls of the city, particularly if they were high, the higher the walls, the more secure you felt, gave you a huge advantage in wartime. And so they, you know, they would put archers along the, the walls. Uh, they would have towers built into the walls that would give them even more strategic advantage. And that invading army would come up, would be very vulnerable to those archers who would be able to shoot down on them. And particularly if they had a water supply within their city, they could hang out for long time. I mean, they could, they could grow their own food in there, and, uh, and they could dwell safely as long as they didn't leave that city, and it made it really difficult for invading armies to, to get through. It would take years oftentimes for even a far more powerful army to, to, to break through and be able to get into that city. And so it's a natural metaphor to use for sort of a false sense of security that the world has. They look at the things that, that they give them a false sense of security, and God says, in the day of judgment, it's not going to help you. I'm going to destroy your city. So again, Isaiah 25 and verse 2, he says about him, you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt few verses later in verse 12, once again, the same theme. It says, in the high fortifications of his walls, he or the Lord will bring down. He will lay them low and cast them to the ground, to the dust. Isaiah chapter 26 comes back to this theme. It says, for he, the Lord, has humbled the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low. He lays it low to the ground. He casts it to the dust. And then in, verse, in chapter 27, Verse 10, for the fortified city is solitary, it's empty. A habitation deserted and forsaken, just like the wilderness. There the calf grazes. There it lies down and strips its branches. In other words, the city that was fortified, that was populated, where people dwelt for safety and security, it's going to be deserted. No one's going to live there. It's just going to become like a wilderness, a place where animals graze and eat just like outside the city. And so these four passages in particular, though, stand in contrast to chapter 26, verses 1 through 4. Because here it says of the people of God, in that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah, in the day of judgment. In the day of judgment, this is the song that will be sung by the people in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He, God, sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him, the inhabitant of that city, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. In contrast to the world who has their cities, their places of comfort and security, where they think that, you know, they're, they're not vulnerable they're strong, they're, they're resistant to uh, any needs. They don't have needs, and, and God says, when I come in judgment, you're going to see how, how pointless your, your cities for uh, salvation and safety really are. They're, they're, they're not going to help you. But the people of God have, as it were, a city that is strong with walls that are, that are large that will protect them. Their city is just a metaphor for God himself. He is their everlasting rock. He is the one in whom they trust. He, in a sense, opens the gates and welcomes any to come in who are willing to place their faith in him, and he provides them with safety and security. And so what we see in these three chapters, this theme of judgment kind of has contrasting emphases. On the one hand, those who put their faith and trust in anything other than God are going to find that, that their sources of security leave them empty. But the people 
who place their faith in him, when that judgment comes, the wicked are going to be driven away. The wicked are going to be removed. Those who rebelled against God will be removed from this world, and thus they will be left in a safe place. It is the believers and those who are the righteous ones who have placed faith in God, judgment will be a blessing to them because it will remove their enemies. And, and the language throughout here is the language of geopolitical enemies. They're the, the foreigners who, who saw Israel and Judah as a threat, who saw them as people to be oppressed, people to be overtaxed, people to be harmed and hurt. When, when the enemies of Israel are destroyed, they're going to then be able to go out and fill the earth. They're going to be able to enjoy life because their enemies are gone. And so as believers, we stop and we think about the reality of the future judgment. When God says he's going to come and he's going to judge this earth, the result will be no more terrorist groups attacking Christians, burning churches. No more evil political leaders passing laws that are oppressive to Christians. No more corrupt judges or DAs refusing to provide justice for the innocent. No more concentration camps where soldiers and guards oppress Christians, no more human traffickers or forced marriages, no more pedophiles or kidnappers. All of the people in this world that make it a dangerous place to live, especially for Christians, will be removed. Judgment will get rid of those people. They will be taken away in judgment, and the result will be salvation, safety, peace, joy, and celebration for the people of God. However, there is one enemy in particular, and this is what I'm going to focus in on this morning, that Isaiah prophesies that God is going to destroy. One enemy in particular that he is going to do away with, in addition to all of the geopolitical enemies, in addition to all of the human concerns that we have, he says specifically that the enemy of death is going to be swallowed up permanently. The Apostle Paul is going to pick up on this passage in Isaiah in his the longest, most detailed writing about death and the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. And in that passage, verse 26, he specifically refers to death as the last enemy, the last enemy to be destroyed. And so my thesis for this morning is this, is that believers celebrate their salvation as God defeats all of their enemies, especially death. Now, when we just kind of take a step back and we look at the, the biblical narrative as a whole, or we look at all of history as a whole, we go, have to go all the way back to the very beginning when God says he created man and woman, and he placed them in a garden, a garden called Eden. And in that garden, they had, they had pleasures abounding. There was pretty much almost nothing was off limits to them, except one tree. One tree, he said, don't eat of that tree. And while I think this was literal, in one sense, that one tree sort of stood for, or as, or as a metaphor for their obedience to him. It, it was sort of the one test. Will you obey me? Will you trust me? Will you have faith in me that what I tell you is to be believed? <clears throat> and the test was, will you eat of this one tree or not? We also have in that garden the, the, the enemy of humankind, Satan, who came in the form of a serpent, of a snake. He deceived Eve. He told her, oh, God's lying to you. That tree is not going to kill you. Because God said the day that you eat of that tree, you will die. Death will come and be a part of your reality. Satan came in and said, he's lying. You are not going to die. In fact, you're going to get better. You're going to become like him. He doesn't want you to be like him. The day you eat of this, your eyes are going to be opened up. It's going to be a whole new, a wonderful experience. And Eve looked at that tree and she said, it does look pretty good. I wonder what I'm missing. And Adam was right there with her. She took, she ate of that. She gave it to her husband. He took and he ate of it. And death came into the human race. From that day forward, a whole bunch of negative consequences resulted. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Sin came into the world through one man, referring to Adam, and death through sin. Death came into the world through sin as a result of sin. And so death spread to all men, to everyone, because all 
have sinned. And you know what? Ever since that very first act by our ancient ancestors, Adam and Eve, we have been experiencing the daily results, the daily consequences of death in our lives. Now, when you're real, real young, you don't really see or experience these things, but the older we get, the more we, we begin to see it in our own bodies. We begin to experience the difference between now and what we used to be, how we used to feel when we woke up in the morning, how we used to look when we looked in the mirror. And there's all of these reminders that death is creeping ever closer and closer and closer, that entropy is pulling on our body, and it is pulling us closer and closer and closer to the grave. We see it with fading beauty, the development of wrinkles, ailing joints, loss of balance, loss of hair, loss of mobility, for some a bent posture, diseases and sicknesses that oftentimes don't even wait until we're older to strike. We see it with memory loss and forms of dementia, weakened muscles, a slowed metabolism, there's lots of things that are just a daily reminder, death is coming. It's getting closer. The grave is that much closer than it was five years ago, two years ago, even a day ago. There was this strange story that took place uh, 2011 in a city called uh, Nizhny Novgorod. It's a city in Russia. And uh, the police were investigating a series of crimes that were taking place at uh, various tombs in, in, in cemeteries across that city in particular. And uh, various graves were being desecrated, vandalized. Uh, people were showing up, uh, and they were of children, children's graves. Uh, and parents would show up to lay flowers there, and they would realize that there was a whole bunch of trash left around uh, this, this one grave. Sometimes this, this person was leaving notes and, uh, and at first they didn't realize it, but eventually they realized that these, these graves were being dug up in the middle of the night and the bodies were being stolen out of the caskets and then the person was covering it back up and, and leaving a mess. And so you can imagine how parents felt. So they, the police were investigating this and uh, this one man, Anatoly Moskvin, who's pictured here, was, uh, was they, 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 the cops called him in as an expert to come and help them figure out what the motivation might be, uh, how, how might they catch this person, because he was a professor at uh, the university, and he was an, an expert in cemeteries and, and death and burial practices and things. He was kind of an eccentric individual, quite odd, socially awkward, but he was super intelligent in a lot of ways, and this was just one area where he was uh, burial practices and things. He had become fascinated with death and and, and so on. And so they called him in to, to help. Well, at one point, they, they showed up at his house unexpected. And when they went into his house, they realized it was just a weird thing. I mean, it was, you'd think he was a hoarder. He had just the house was super cluttered and a mess. But in the midst of all of this clutter and mess, he had these large dolls around the house, dozens of them uh, around the house. Some were sitting on shelves, some were sitting around tables with like uh, food settings set up in front of them, and they looked almost like paper mache dolls that had, you know, painted faces and things. But uh, as the investigators kind of got closer and looked, they realized that they weren't dolls. They were the mummified remains of children that he had been digging up. He was the perpetrator. He was the one who had been committing these crimes. He was eventually considered to be mentally unfit to stand trial. He suffered from uh, mental, some sort of a mental disease, that's what they concluded, and he was certainly delusional in his thinking, but, but his reason, his rationale was he felt sorry for these children who had died so young, and he had been involved in some occultic things, but he believed that he could bring them back to life, essentially, that he could deliver them from the grave if he would bring them back, mummify their bodies, and treat them like his own children. Now, we say that guy is strange, and he certainly is, but, you know, there's sort of the desire in his heart. The thing that drove him to do that is something that is innate to all of us, this desire to figure out how to conquer the grave, how to overcome the grave, how to, how to save and rescue people, particularly those who didn't even get to live much of, a, much of a life at all. How do we deliver them from the grave? How do we help them? How do we save them from that fate, and how do we save ourselves from that fate? 
sort of this driving desire in all of us. And, and the promise that God gives to his people through the prophet Isaiah would have been a first, really, in the Old Testament. It, it would have been amazing. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 5, God promises, he says this, he will, speaking of God, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. He comes back to this theme in chapter 26. In chapter 26 and verse 19, he says this about those who have already died. He says, your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. I mean, think about how revolutionary that promise must have seemed to people in the Old Testament times. The idea that death would be swallowed up no more. At some point, God was going to make it so that people would no longer die. And even those who had already died would rise again. They would, their bodies would come out of the grave, and they would sing for joy. They would, they would celebrate the new life that they had with singing. This passage becomes the one that, that was on the Apostle Paul's heart when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the, the longest unit of, in, in all of the Bible talking about the resurrection. And we know this because Paul specifically quotes from it near the end. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54, as he's kind of building to his conclusion, he says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, their new body, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It's, it'll finally come to pass at the resurrection. Now, when we think about death, it, it, you know, death is, is, is an enemy that is inevitable for all. It is something that it doesn't matter what benefit you might have that benefits you in a lot of other areas of life, it does nothing to benefit you when it comes to opposing death. The physically strong, those who are, who are really strong physically, you can't overpower death. Those who are blessed with lots of wealth, lots of income, you can't bribe death. You can't bribe it away, pay it off somehow. The crafty, you can't trick it. You can't bargain with death and get it to leave you alone. The powerful leader can't just pass laws to, to prevent death from striking them. They can't just assume that their relationships that have maybe kept them out of trouble other times when they've done things that others would get in trouble for. They can't somehow think that because they're a leader, because they have this position, that somehow death won't affect them. Even the discreet and the inconspicuous cannot hide from death. There is no escaping this enemy. And have you ever stopped and thought about all of the money that people spend, especially in America today, how much people spend to try to postpone death? I mean, the entire medical industry is essentially an industry that revolves around postponing death. There was an article in Forbes magazine in 2012 um, about how much the average family, the average individual ultimately spends on health care. It said a family of four spends on average about $21,000 on health care. Additionally, the U.S. government, through tax money and such, spends an additional $8,600 per person when you figure that out, that, that adds up to about $14,000 per person annually is spent trying to postpone death. And that's only looking at the issue of health care. That doesn't include uh, things like cancer research or all of the tax money or grant money or, or donations from businesses or individuals that go to you know, the Heart Foundation or cancer research or anything else that, again, is, is trying to figure out how can we postpone death. And then when you add in things like exercise equipment, healthy foods, vitamins, skin creams, makeup, hair dye, all the things to cover up the effects of death, 
that's coming and aging. I mean, the amount of money we spend and we invest trying to handle this one enemy, the enemy of death, it's kind of astounding. Joseph Bailey wrote a somewhat famous book entitled The Last Thing We Talk About, speaking about death. He is one who's had various children die prematurely, and he uh, reflects on this issue of death and writes about it in this book. But anyways, he says one of, uh, short quote in there, he says, we may postpone it, we may tame its violence, but death is still there waiting for us. Death spares none. And so once again, I ask the question, how amazing, how phenomenal is this promise of God that he would swallow up death forever? That those who have already died, whose bodies are already buried long ago, that there was coming a day when they would come out of that grave, when they would repopulate a new heaven and a new earth. It's not just the geopolitical enemies of Israel who were a threat to their survival that he was going to deal with, but death itself was going to be dealt with. Now, it would be another 700 years after this prophecy before people would begin to realize because Jesus would come on this earth, he would live, he would die, and then he would rise again that people would begin to realize, oh, it's through the resurrection of Jesus that these promises are going to be fulfilled. But Paul, as he's reflecting on that truth, as he's reflecting on that reality as a good Jew... He writes in 1 Corinthians 15, and he brings these passages together. And there he writes and he says, you know, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only while we're still alive, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For if by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. First of all, he says here, he says, you know, when you think about the human story and, and, and sort of the narrative of all of humanity, there's a sense in which Adam made decisions that impacted every other human being. This one man's decision to sin against God, to, to, to choose disobedience, even though he was warned that it would lead to death, that one decision has negatively impacted everybody who's in Adam or who's in Adam. Everybody who's born a son of Adam, that's every person. Everybody who traces their, their lineage back to Adam, that's every human being, died as a result of Adam's sin. And so he says it's only logical that the opposite could be true. That one man could come as the solution to all of humanity. That that one man could come and undo what Adam did. And anyone who is born in him would then reap the benefits. Paul says that was Jesus. Jesus was, he doesn't use the terminology here, but theologians will say Jesus is the second Adam. He's the one who came a second time, or he came after Adam, and he lived that perfect life. He died, he conquered death when he rose again, and he offered by free gift to anyone who would have faith in him that they could be in him. He says anyone who is in Christ, anyone who's been born a child of God through faith in Christ, they reap the rewards and the benefits that Jesus earned. In the resurrection. And so it's, it's this idea of one man on behalf of everybody. One man's sin on behalf of everybody led to death. One man's righteousness and resurrection on behalf of all who by faith are in him leads to resurrection. And thus, Jesus is referred to as the first fruits. The first fruits, the one who comes back first. John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24, Jesus, as he's when he was here on earth, as he was predicting about his own coming death, he described it this way. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. It doesn't produce anything. But if it dies, a reference to it being buried in the ground, kind of a metaphor there, but if it dies, then it bears much fruit. 
His burial is likened to the planting of a seed into the ground. If you just keep that seed and you just leave it sitting on your dining room table or you leave it in that packet that you get when you buy it at the store or wherever, if you just leave it there, it just nothing happens to it. it. It just stays as it is. But if it dies, metaphorically, if it's placed into the ground like it's buried, like a dead body, what's going to happen to it? It gets watered, it germinates, it grows, and it produces a whole lot more fruit. That's how Jesus likens his death, burial, and resurrection. He's going to be buried into the ground, and the result is that he's going to produce a lot of fruit. Now, I brought with me two, two similar-looking plants. The one, uh, I don't know what kind of plant this is, but uh, they're just ones we had around the house. But this one here, as you can look, you can see, well, it's, it's growing. It, it, it's got life to it. It's green. It's, it's evident to all. This one here, if I showed you closer, you know, it's, it's just a bunch of soil. That's what it looks like. There's nothing there. It just looks like a bunch of dirt. But if I told you that there was a seed planted in here, and that that seed had been watered, and then I asked you the question, well, which of these two is a symbol of life? Without thinking, you might immediately say, oh, well, it's this one. Because it's, it's got that life growing up and out of it. But with just, just a little bit more reflection, it kind of becomes obvious. Wait, wait a minute. If that seed was planted and it was watered, there's something happening in there. It's germinated. Actually, both of them are a symbol of life. Both of them equally represent life. One is simply life below the surface. We don't see it. It's kind of below the surface. The other one is evident to all. We can see this one. In, in essence, what Jesus is saying is he's the first fruits. He's the one that's been planted and he's already come up out of the ground. And we can see the life in him. Now, those who are connected to him by faith, they've got the same sort of life in them. The same sort of eternal life has been promised and guaranteed to them. It's already in them, in fact. It just isn't evident yet. And so what's the evidence of our new life? Jesus' resurrection. That becomes the evidence for us. It's the proof to us that we will rise again. We look at Jesus and we say, he rose again. So I know death's been conquered. I know death isn't final. And he's told me that if I'm connected to him, as him, so me. And so the evidence of our resurrection is not what we see in our own lives. All we see is life and then we die. At least that's what it seems like. But Jesus promises us in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus was talking uh, to Mary and, and Martha, and this was in the scene of when Lazarus died, and he says to them, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. In other words, those who die, if they believe in me, because I am the resurrection, they too will live. And then he says this, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, now which one is it? Is it that he dies and then he rises again, or is it that he never dies? He seems like he's talking about life from two different angles. In the one sense, he's talking about just the physical life here that we see and experience with the physical bodies we have now. Yeah, they're going to die. But then they're going to live again because those bodies will be raised up again to life. But in the other sense, he seems to be talking about the soul, the spiritual life. And for those, he says, that life, those who live and believe in me, they've got this spiritual life. The reality is for them, he says, they actually never die. In other words, the spiritual life is something we possess already. It's already inside of us. It's a reality that is indwelling. It's not a reality that we await. And such is that reality that even physical death doesn't have anything to do with taking away the spiritual life that we already possess. Physical death does nothing to continue our spiritual life. We actually never die. It's, again, an amazing promise of Jesus. This brings us back to the burning question that we started with, and that is, what is our perspective when we attend a funeral of a young one who died? A child, a teenager, a young adult, even, even an older person who died in Christ. And we look at it, and maybe we ask that question, God, why didn't you do anything? I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I asked you to intervene on their behalf. Why didn't you? Why didn't you step in and, and prevent that? And I think the, the answer to that question, again, I don't mean this to sound 
dismissive of the pain that people, that all of us feel at the death of a loved one. But the, the, the theological answer to the question is, God did do something. He did intervene on behalf of that one. He did intervene on behalf of the whole humanity. In fact, he did something far better than simply intervening with the circumstance that was facing that person in that moment. I mean, had God answered that prayer in essence by saying, okay, I'm going to take away the cancer. Okay, I'm going to actually have protected them in the car when they were driving to wherever before the accident. All he would have done is prolonged their life, maybe for a short time until the next obstacle came along that eventually took their life. He wouldn't have actually taken care of death itself. He simply would have taken care of one more obstacle on the path toward death, and then eventually they would have died. Instead, God came in and he said, I'm going to deal with death itself. The enemy of death itself, God came in and he promised all the way back in the days of Isaiah and said, I'm going to swallow it up for good. I'm going to get rid of it permanently. And even those who have already died before I step in and bring about that solution, they're covered as well. If, in fact, they lived in faith, with faith in me. He did do something to save. And again, I, this isn't meant to remove or trivialize the pain of the loss. It's not meant to be this cliche that we throw out at a funeral and say, okay, everybody can stop crying now, let's rejoice. That's not... I don't mean it at all in that sense. Death is still painful. There is still a very real loss. But as Paul says elsewhere in the New Testament, in, in, in his letter to the, to the church at Thessalonica, he says we have a whole different perspective on death that enables us to find joy in the midst of that pain. We have hope in the midst of that loss. First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 14, he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers about those who are asleep, those who have died already. You don't have to grieve as others do who have no hope. We're not like those who have no hope. We grieve differently. Because since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And finally, what I see is that the appropriate response, the appropriate response to this truth is celebration. The people of God should celebrate. It should excite us to stop and think about the reality that death has been swallowed up through Jesus and that ultimately one day it will not be a reality in any sense. Paul makes that point. He ends his long uh, lecture, or teaching, whatever you want to call it, in 1 Corinthians 15, his treatise, whatever, on death death and the resurrection, he ends it by saying this, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he says this, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He uses the language of a taunt. He taunts death. It's sort of like what you would expect if a, if a powerful army came and attacked a much smaller one, and somehow the much smaller one prevailed and defeated the other one. You can just kind of picture them in their excitement and celebration afterward, you know, taunting the, the, more, the more powerful oppressor. Oh, hey, where's your sting? Where's your strength? I thought you were going to beat us. You lose, we win. That's sort of the language here. Oh, death, where is your sting? Where's it at? Where's your victory? Where's your power? He says it's non-existent. Jesus has made your sting go away. You lose, we win. And he ends by saying, thanks be to God, the one who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a, a book I read a few years back entitled uh, The Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin, which isn't actually his real name. It's sort of a, uh, another name that he chose for this to remain a little more anonymous. And uh, in, the, in the early chapters, he gives a little bit of his own testimony of how he came to know Jesus as a Savior. He talks about growing up in a church when he was young, and um, his experience there was, you know, as a child, as a six, seven-year-old, he did not enjoy church. Uh, it was sort of boring, and 
he just kind of waited for the pastor to be done. But there was one point where his older brother said to him, you know, it's, it's kind of time for you to recognize that you need God in your life and that you need to be saved. And so next week when the pastor does his weekly altar call, you need to go forward. And he said, I didn't really understand it, but my brother said I needed to. So next week when the pastor gave an altar call, I went forward and the pastor said, well, why are you here? He said, I don't know. My brother told me to come up. And uh, so the pastor said, well, I'll talk to you after the service. You know, you, you sit here. And anyways, his point was that really wasn't a meaningful come to Jesus moment for him. But sometime later, a few years later, he was 11 years old. He said, I was sitting in church. It was an Easter Sunday. And the pastor was telling the story of all that Jesus did, went through what he did on the cross. And he says, I just was tracking with him that whole time. And I was following what he said. And I was feeling the emotion of Jesus, the son of God, and, and, and what he went through as he was put on that cross as he was being mocked, and I thought about the injustice of it all, and then he got to the point about the resurrection. And he says this, he says, when the preacher finally got to the Easter morning part of the story, the part about the rolled away stone, the angel, the empty tomb, and the resurrected Jesus, something deep inside of me wanted to shout right out loud, hooray! I felt like breaking into song, just like the crowds in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. As I tried to imagine what would happen if I actually did that, I quickly glanced around at the people around me. Other children were drawing or writing on their bulletins. Some fidgeted. Others stared blankly deep into their private daydreams. The majority of the adults that I could see seemed to be sitting and listening intently enough, looking and acting no different from any other Sunday during any other sermon. I felt like shouting, Hey, everyone, are you listening to this? I had sat around some of those same folks at football games where they would yell and scream. How in the world was it that these people managed to get so much more excited about what happened at a high school football field on Friday nights than they did about the resurrection of Jesus at church on Easter Sunday morning? That didn't compute in my 11-year-old mind. I simply could not fathom how it was that nobody cared enough to be truly celebrating this incredible story that Jesus' death and resurrection that we were hearing. And my challenge to all of us is to enter into that this week, to stop and think a little bit about what this story entails. I was thinking about this yesterday while I was in the shower, and I thought, you know, imagine if David, I was thinking about the story in the Old Testament of David dancing before the Lord and dancing in excitement when the tabernacle, uh, when the um, Ark of the Covenant was brought back uh, to, uh, for the tabernacle and how he was so excited and he was dancing and some people looked at him and thought he was you know, out of line and inappropriate and, and way too ostentatious. And I thought to myself, imagine what David, if he had a time machine and we were able to bring him into the first century and we were able to tell him the story about how that Messiah that was talked about was actually God himself in the form of a human being. What? He put on flesh, he came to this earth, and then when he grew up, he died. He gave himself over to death. Huh? Yeah, you know all those sacrifices in the Old Testament? They all pointed to him. He fulfilled it. And then as he's trying to get his mind around that and to say, but here's the greatest part. Three days later, he came out of the grave, and he told everybody that that's what would happen to them if they had faith in him. I mean, just imagine the excitement of a guy like David trying to get his mind around these promises that he thought he understood through the lens of Jesus. And so my challenge to you this week is to try to just think about those truths. Let it impact your heart. Let it grab your emotions about how amazing it is that our God has conquered death for us. This morning, we have the opportunity to celebrate that in what we would call a mini feast. Sort of a foretaste, if you would. A feast of one to come, and I'm going to talk about it in a few moments. But we're going to take, partake of communion this morning as a celebration of God's victory over death for us. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts for that. Father, I do thank you. I thank you for the wonderful, amazing truth that you have conquered death for us. We still await some of the realities of the fulfillment of that, we know. But there's not a funeral that we don't attend of a person who's Put their faith and trust in you that we don't have reason for hope, reason for joy and celebration at some level. That we get to see those people again if we too are those who have faith in you. Thank you. We celebrate together this morning, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing, wonderful sacrifice on our behalf, for rising again and conquering death. In your son's name we ask and pray all these things. Thank you. 
please remain seated. Um, as they pass the elements, um, feel free to sing with us.
chapter 25. I didn't read this verse yet, or these verses. But in chapter 25, verses 6 through 8, he says this. He says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. What is that veil? What is that uh, covering? Verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Part of the, the great promise of the celebration, because the theme of celebration runs through these chapters too. I mean, if you read it, you'd note all the places where it talks about song or singing. I put a little music note on the side of my margins every place where it's at, because there's this contrast that runs throughout. The wicked and those who, who reject God, their songs will be, will be stopped. No more singing, no more dancing. But the people of God and the righteous, they're going to break out in joy and singing because of the promises of these chapters. And here, God describes that celebration as a great feast, a feast that he is going to hold uh, for his people. It's a feast that includes the best of the meats and the, the well-aged wine. It's going to be the greatest of food. And I think Jesus alludes specifically to this feast when he's in the upper room talking to his disciples. In Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 18, it says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover feast with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had Given thanks, he said, take, eat, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He says, there's coming a day where I'm going to feast with you again. We're going to eat together again. We're going to drink together again. In fact, this is the last time that I'm going to have this feast, this Passover feast, which looks to the, full, the, which looks to the, the fact that, that um, there was provision made for sin. In that same discussion with him, Jesus says, I am in one sense the fulfillment of all that this points to. But notice how he describes the kingdom of God and what's going to happen there when he eats again. He says that this Passover feast, it will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I'm not going to eat of it again until I eat it, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What we do here as we partake of this small amount of juice or wine and this small wafer or this piece of bread, which is symbolic of the body and the blood of Jesus. It's really just a foretaste of a feast to come. We're reminding ourselves that the feast, the celebration is yet to come. The ultimate celebration when death is done away with, when resurrection is a reality, we, 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 we look forward to it and this is just a, a regular reminder for us of that, that there's coming a joyous feast. And so Let's partake together of this, starting with the bread. Let me read those, those verses again. It says, And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's partake of this together as well. Father, it's a great reminder 
that we should be longing for another feast, a feast that is yet to come, of the best foods, the best there is to drink. And we're going to do it together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Most importantly, we're going to do it with you. And Jesus Christ in the flesh will be there, administering as our host this wonderful feast that he has prepared for us. It's a great act of generosity and grace. But I pray that we would even enter into that now, in our lives now, that we would experience the joy and the celebration, regardless of our circumstances, regardless even of the nearness of death, that we would be able to enter into that celebration of the one who has conquered death once and for all. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.